But loading that way, and here's the weird part, it doesn't seem to cause as much damage on the body. Like I don't, I recover faster with a higher intensity with the bands than I would with the weights, mm -hmm. for example. So it's a really interesting uh, way of adding intensity without causing too much more yeah. recovery necessity. And you, know? you see really how much stronger you are in certain parts of the lift. Oh yeah. It's just very obvious. Like, like you said, like you could increase that by like a hundred pounds, you know, midway through and, and you're able to, uh, you know, complete that, that exercise. But yeah, it's, I love working with them, especially for, for all those sticking point reasons and to, you know, have the flexibility of moving the weight faster. Yeah. Here's an advanced technique uh, that actually can help almost anybody. It's progressive resistance. So you can use advanced techniques like chains to do this, or you can use resistance bands. Believe it or not, adding resistance bands to your normal exercises produces something called progressive resistance, and the strength and muscle adaptations tend to accelerate when you do this. Is this why so all the bands? Of you. Is this why all the bands are on the deadlift platform this yeah. morning? Yeah, I know, saw that. I, you know, it's funny. so. Do you guys remember the first time you implemented this in your training and how it, how it felt to you? Yeah, oh, yeah. it was it, for me. It was uh, I, I don't remember what I was reading. I was reading something. I think it was a West Side Barbell Club, and they used mm -hmm. uh, chains quite a bit in bands, and they referred to it, you know, as learning from the Soviets. So I went back and looked at studies and I said, this is weird. Cause I always thought of bands as being like, you know, second fiddle and kind of like, oh, this is nothing. And I remember adding bands to my deadlift and the feel I got from it was incredible. And my strength gains accelerated dramatically from using bands and chains. And now it's like a staple in my, my workout. Yeah. I remember I started off with like more fractional weights. And so it was just like one little like a uh, quarter weight plate that I would put on oh, yeah. there. And then like just the magnet one incrementally. Yeah. And then you put those little, yeah, exactly. Those little like square magnets on the ends. And, um, it was interesting, uh, to, you know, to, to work out like that. But then once I got introduced to, you know, rubber bands and, and chains and it was Westside Barbell that did that, it was like, oh, wow, I can, I can work on these sticking points, especially with the squat too, where I was having, you know, difficulty in the hole there, but like now adding, you know, rubber bands. So it gets more difficult as you come up was like game changer. The for me. irony for me, that Westside Barbell was one that made it really popular, but it was introduced to me like through like sports performance. So I thought it was like more of just like a, an athletic tool. Mm, like if you were like trying speed to speed training, yeah, speed training, explosive training. And so I really didn't dabble with it till later. I didn't see the benefits of like strength and muscle until way later, even though I know that West side barbell were the ones that really made that popular. But I was, I was, when I saw it, it was like athletes that were using yeah. it. And, I totally disregarded yeah. it because I, you know, and this is bad on me. I didn't think about it. I saw it and just said, why would you add resistance with bands when you can just yeah. add weights? And I didn't think too much about it. And then there was a, a this was probably, I want to say 10 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> I, I started to think about it a little bit and I said, wait a minute, the band becomes more challenging the further it stretches out. So mm -hmm. if I put it on a deadlift and let's say I have 200 pounds on the deadlift at the bottom, it's not adding much resistance at all, you know, yeah. a few pounds. But as I pull up and the band stretches, the resistance gets heavier and heavier. Now, why is this a good thing? Because in my, in a deadlift, I become stronger the more I straighten out. I'm obviously the weakest at the bottom, strongest at the top. And so one of the challenges with traditional weights is that the resistance stays the same the whole time, but I'm stronger at the top. What if I want more resistance to the top and less resistance to the bottom to match my strength curve? Well, that's what the bands provided. And once I threw them on, Oh my, it was a total game changer for me. Literally, I was at sticking points with my lifts and I saw them just blow through the roof because of it. Well, what you have to explain yeah. in regards to the strength curve, it literally takes an exercise that maybe you've been doing for a decade of your life and changes it. Totally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you get used to that that same strength curve because it, it emulates that with free weights. It's always going to be the same, no matter how mm -hmm. much weight you put on or take off. Like, well, no matter what kind of barbell you use, I mean, that strength curve looks the same. To your point, it's really, really difficult. We're talking about a deadlift, really difficult at the bottom. Gets easier and easier as you get to the top. You simply flipping that on its head by putting like bands on there, and mm -hmm. the, actually the resistance gets harder as you get to yes. the top. It changes the exercise. It it's does. almost like it's a new exercise. And so, imagine training a certain way or a certain exercise for years and years and then someone all of a sudden introducing these tools to you it's like them introducing you to a new exercise that you've never used before it is yeah. let's be honest though we got um we found that because chains look cool 
<laughs> I mean, that's, I, I'm thinking back, I'm like, oh, whoa, what are they doing over there? I was like, that looks so cool. That's actually what I thought when I first saw chains. I, I thought it was just, oh, they're just trying to look cool for the camera. Yeah. And so they're going to lift something other than weights. Not because with chains, it's the same thing, right? As you lift the chain off the ground, a link comes off the ground. And so the weight becomes heavier. progressively heavier. Now I will say this, and because you may look at chains and, and bands and think, oh, it's all progressive resistance. It's all the same. It's not. Chains feel very different than bands. And you can have a band tied at the bottom or a band mm -hmm. assisted you at the top, which you think is the same because, oh, it's easier at the bottom. It's harder at the top, either if the bands are attached to the top or the bottom. No, it still feels very different. Yeah. So there's lots of different ways. Smoother for sure. Yes. And then here's another more advanced uh, way of using bands. I, I think I did this with you, Adam. You and I worked out once early days. Oh, pulling away with the deadlift. Yeah. I yeah. actually attached the bands at a slight angle, which made it so that the lockout was much more challenging because I'm pulling away from the bands and it changes the feel of the deadlift. Then when you took the bands yeah. off, it's like you felt so Well, I love strong. that for the deadlift too, like uh, for more acceleration. So oh, I yeah. can I can work on that like, you know, decently heavy, but then it, that lockout part to really emphasize like driving that force and power in that lockout. Yeah, I just, so I just did a, a deadlift workout today and I'm, I'm, I'm re-implementing deadlifts. And I think I'm going to go for, you know, a, a PR at some point coming up. We'll see what happens if my ego ends up getting me injured or not. But anyway, we have this really cool rack. I've got the name of it where you could put, and we, we bought these really thick bands. I don't know if you did this on purpose, Justin, but these bands are, it's, <laughs> they're super thick. They're yeah. ridiculously yeah. tight. It's almost impossible. And they're super hard. And so I put a few of them on there at different stages, which is kind of cool. So this rack allows me to put like bands here, bands here, bands here. So as I'm lifting, the resistance jumps up the higher I get. Yeah. And I had 315 on the bar and I, I swore to God at the very end when I had, I had three stages of bands on, it felt at the top like 575. Yeah. So it's like 315 and then I get up, 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 up. And then I'm like, and it wants to rip the bar out of my hands. But loading that way, and here's the weird part, it doesn't seem to cause as much damage on the body. Like I don't, I recover faster with a higher intensity with the bands than I would with the weights, mm -hmm. for example. So it's a really interesting uh, way of adding intensity without causing too much more yeah. recovery necessity. And yeah. you see really how much stronger you are in certain parts of the lift. Oh yeah. It's just very obvious. Like, like you said, it, like you could increase that by like a hundred pounds, you know, midway through and, and you're able to, uh, you know, complete that, that exercise. But yeah, it's, I love working with them, especially for, for all those sticking point reasons and to, you know, have the flexibility of moving the weight faster. Yeah. Did you guys, did you guys, speaking of bands, did you guys use bands first for strength, uh, progressive overloading, or did you guys use it for like distraction and like uh, corrective type stuff first? Do you oh, remember? corrective first. I, I, I thought, you, I thought that's what the value was. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's interesting because I, I mean, assisted stuff like for, um, with clients, I would use it for like dips and, um, for, for pull-ups, but, uh, in, in terms of like the band distraction stuff, I probably came to that after the performance so, side. Yeah. So you were after performance. After, performance. yeah. My, my experience with bands was, I thought it was, oh, if you don't have equipment, you could use this. Yeah. And then it was, oh, this is good for rehab because physical yeah. therapists would often use Kelly bands. Kelly Starrett that introduced and, me to that. And then when I grand opened the, the, the 24 Fitness on Santa Teresa, the uh, the free weight and machine area were under construction, but the cardio area was open. And so people were coming to work out and the trainers were like, well, how do we train people with resistance? And so, you know, I'm like, well, let's use body weight and bands. And then I saw people working out with the bands and these were clients that were beginner, intermediate, advanced. And the, the they started progressing really, really well to the point where, the, where a lot of the trainers kept a lot of bands in their sessions. Whereas at that point, you didn't see too much band training, but that was it. And then it was when I would read about West Side Barbell and that stuff, and that's when I... Yeah, I, you know, I'm, uh -huh. I'm, I'm trying to remember which one came first for me. I, I actually think I use band distraction for, like, corrective stuff more than I use bands for, like, progressively overloading. I think I used, I've utilized that as a tool more than using it for strength. Did you guys use it the wrong way at first, like I did? With well, correction, yeah, yeah. The very first time I did stuff like I, I the mm. like when you, for example, opposite. I did yeah. the opposite what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I remember that. That was early, early on. Yeah, because I remember seeing that with. I remember that being like, uh, like for example, uh, like somebody's knees collapsing in, and then you were squeezing a basketball while they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I squeezing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're making problems. it worse. Oh, I had a client whose knee would travel was would like travel in. Yeah. So I'd use the band to hold the leg out. 
Yeah. Which just gave them more resistance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And I couldn't yeah. figure That's out. That's the what, same concept. That's, uh, what you did is the exact same thing the idea with the basketball was squeezing in. You're making. Yeah, but why is that confusing? The, so, because so, like, it'll hold so you So, trainers yeah. know that would be the, the opposite, would be extremely valuable, right? So, if you had. If you had a client, let's say their left their left knee caves in when they do a squat, right, or even a lunge, right. So every time they lunge, you see it, it caves in. Then actually taking a band and anchoring it to the right, right. So the, say it's the left knee when I so lunge. they have to actively push out. Yeah, so they have to actively push out so the band doesn't cave them in. That's actually a really good exercise to train them to activate that glute med that helps open up the hip right there. Very effective. Mm -hmm. Very very uh, basic effective. correctional exercise tool. Yeah. Um, and I apologize to all the clients that I did the opposite. I literally would do the opposite. Like, oh, your knees yeah, are moving in. Let's yeah. put this ball there so they yeah, don't move guilty. anymore. Yeah, yeah. And I just made shit worse. <laughs> so, so terrible. But anyway, it was a. Um, I, I love the feel of them. And again, I feel like I did. I must have done ten sets. I just deadlifted for about an hour and, and twenty minutes with with the bands and just moving them up and adding speed and stuff like that. And it doesn't feel nearly as taxing on me as if I did it, which is yeah, heavy weight. less damaging. Now, what's sure. your what's your theory on the adaptation process? Do you think the body uh, it adapts to it really fast, and so it's a tool that you can only use for kind of a little while before you need to move along from it? Do you think that you can incorporate it and stick with it in your routine for an extended mm -hmm. period of time? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Like, right now you're using bands. Yeah. Like, yeah. Are you doing that one time to interrupt your training session, or are you going to keep that in there once a week? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll do it once a week, or or. Once every other week is what I'm going to start doing. So like this For week, how long before you probably drop them? Um, well, okay. So this is personal, right? So, and what I mean by that is this is my own individual goal. So this may be different depending on the person, but I, you know, I, I said to myself, cause I went through a period of, of cutting cause I did some photos for a program we're going to release later on. And then I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to start eating a little more. And then I saw my strength go up and I said, you know, what? I haven't, I, the, the most I've ever pulled off the ground was 600 pounds. I'm 43. It'd be great if I could do that again. Let's see how my body holds up. So I'm trying to, I'm kind of like slowly moving that way. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning of the week, I pulled, uh, I was doing singles with like 520, 530, which felt, it felt like I had another 20, 30 pounds. So it was a good workout weight. So that was Monday. So today's Friday. So I'm not going to go put five plates on the right, bar and right. go heavy again. So I put 315, use the bar, use bands to practice speed and whatever. So I'll probably keep some, something similar like that, depending on how I feel. So I would do it for like like a four week block <clears throat> consistently every week, and then I'd actually want to drop them completely and see how that translates into I my see. regular training <laughs> yeah. and see if I got something out of it. Yeah, I tend to do yeah similar, but usually like a two week. Uh, and I used it as like a transition into like another adaptation. I was going to like go in a different phase and, and attack something else. So especially if I was doing like you know just more power lifting, more like compound lifts, and I'm trying to like press you know closer to, to PR and max range and then you know and then shift right before i like super, like i get to my max I, i'll shift and, and do like bands and uh chain work uh for like two weeks and then i'll kind of start over and do something else yeah and I, and I will say this just for me like I, I i enjoy the bodybuilding style of training the hypertrophy the pump the feel i also enjoy the strength and the way that that feels but it's the strength stuff that I enjoy the most. Like when I do this, it's just so much more fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me sad because that's the one that I'm going to have to do less and less <laughs> as I get older because I can't keep pushing weight um, as I get older. It's just not smart. The risk versus reward at this point yeah. doesn't make any more sense. But like today I did this workout and it's just, it's the most fun. It's the most, I could, it's like when I do that and I feel that and I feel the low reps and I feel the way it feels on my, I could care less about the pump yeah. in comparison, but I don't know. It's yeah. one of those things yeah, that yeah. kind of sucks. All right, everybody, the giveaway today is MAPS Prime. This is the program that gets you ready for your workouts. Whatever workout you're doing, if you set up properly with MAPS Prime, you'll be stronger, faster, better mobility, and get better recovery. Okay, so you can get it for free, but here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you do all of those things, uh, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won if we pick your comment, and then you'll get free access to MAPS Prime. Also, we got a sale going on right now. We have bundled together multiple MAPS programs in different combinations for different goals, popular combinations. I think there's like 10 bundles available right now of two or three workout programs. Here's the best part. Every single bundle is only $99.99. Okay, so go to mapsaugust.com and find the bundle or bundles that work best for you. And again, don't forget, every single bundle, whether it's two or three programs, is only $99. 99 and this sale is not lasting for long it ends august 14th so go check it out
No. Did you guys see that? Did I send you guys the video of the 27-year-old man? It's okay. It brought me to tears. Actually, it was actually. Uh, you don't see this very often. This 27-year-old, 27-year-old uh, dude was driving home, and saw this is true. Saw a house on fire. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pulls over. I saw this. I did pulls see over. That. It gives me the chills. Pulls over. Because there's no one there, no He's police, a pizza no nothing. delivery guy, right? Yeah, nothing, nothing else was like there was no one there helping, right? Or yeah. so, so he pulls over, he go and he hears kids oh in the God. house. He f runs in the house and saves each of these kids. Now at the very so after uh, I think he saved it was like six or eight. It was like four or five kids, right? Gets to the where? What, what's where are the parents? What's four or five kids? I don't in know like what the whole story is. In a burning is. house. In a burning. I don't know what the whole story is. Okay, but there's video of this because at the end there's someone recording, and then the fire department gets there, and you see him running out. That's the part that made me that brought me to tears. I have children, so it's just yeah. if he this guy was if this guy saved my kids, I'm gonna tell you right now, I would take care of this guy for the rest of his yeah, life. We're gonna saint him. Oh, so he runs in, saves each kid. Obviously, house, you know, house is just burst into flames. It's getting worse and worse. He gets like the third kid out, I think it was, because then then they're like the baby, the baby's in there. Mm -hmm. So this and he says, and, and this was the story corroborated by people who were there. It was pitch black smoke. Takes his shirt, wraps around his head, so he's blind, can't see anything. He's feeling around, going by the cries, grabs this baby, runs out, and this is when they ca they catch him on video. And you see this guy walking, running out, yeah. and you could tell he's about to pass out. Hands the baby over to a firefighter, collapses on the ground. And he's fucked. You yeah, can tell he's fucked. They got to take him to the hospital because he ingested so much smoke. And so he's been recovering there for days. And there was a GoFundMe for him, which yeah. has raised something like half a million dollars or something like that because of it. But you see this, he's a 27-year-old kid. Yeah. He runs out, he walks out, and, he, and, he, and you Smart hear him. Smart to know to wrap the shirt around his head. Well, I mean, would he? Oh, well, I wouldn't even think. I would just like try and run and save him, probably pass out and die myself. Oh. Yeah. I wouldn't it, even have the awareness to even think But of the that. part that brought me to, like almost brought me to tears is first of all, you see him running out and you see the kid. And so like as a father, you're like, oh, please, God, hope this kid. And the kid was okay. Yeah. But then you hear him as he's like on the ground catching his breath, and you could tell he's messed up. He's like, you can hear him, and he's like, I hope the baby's okay. I hope the baby makes it or whatever. That's all he could care about. Yeah. Like, man, we need some, more some heroic shit. Right we need there, more dude. people. Like it's that. crazy it. you bring up that story. So I told you guys that I was talking to Brett on the drive to work today. Mm -hmm. So Brett works on our on our marketing side, right? And he's about to have a baby. He's having a baby. It's going to be his first baby, right? In, Exciting. Uh, in about three months, three or four months, I think the the baby's due. And so I was asking him some questions like, you know, does it feel real yet? This and that. And he's just like, you know, honestly, a lot of my life hasn't changed yet. And I'm like, I was the same way. I said, until it doesn't really change till it happens. And then he was asking me, well, what things have you noticed about yourself that is like, like really different? Like as soon as a kid, I said, you know, it's funny. I said, there was two big things that I noticed. One, I got really weird financially. Like all of a sudden I became like this miser. Like I was ne <laughs> never was at that. I'm in a place where I, had, I, have, I have more financial freedom today than I did, you know, say five, six years ago. But yet uh, now all of a sudden I'm tighter with my finances than I, I have ever been. And I think that has a lot to do with just having the family and stuff. Of course. And so then the other one was the one I shared on the podcast a long time ago. Remember when I told you guys when Max was new and I was watching that that Netflix show, the the medieval one? Oh yeah. Where the where the the the, the king comes in, it's like part of the oh, where the king yeah. comes in and takes all the firstborn sons. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. And I remember getting all like teary-eyed and like I was clenching up, <laughs> like Max was sleeping on me. And I was all, all by myself. Like Katrina was out at a concert that night. It was my first <laughs> night alone with Max. And we were watching, he was sleeping on my chest, and I'm watching this. I was getting all emotional. <laughs> I was like, I, that would never have happened to me before i said those were two big ones that i remember that totally yeah changed i me. for for me and this i had this experience obviously with my firstborn and with each one because i got three now i got a fourth one on the way with each one it's becoming different this particular thing i'm gonna say but when my firstborn when when you know he was obviously in his mom's womb it was uh and i didn't realize this but it was just this abstract idea for me because mm -hmm. as a dad and if you're a, if you're a new dad or you're be going to become a dad, this is really interesting for for men. I don't think women experience this, but it was just this abstract idea. Like, yeah, I know there's a baby in there. You know, I could feel it kick sometimes, but mom's connected. Yeah. Like, mom already has a relationship with this baby. It's not really real yet. No, us. she feels him. She feels him moving. She's got all this stuff happening. You know, if the baby's not moving, she's worried. Like, she's connected to this human. Right. As dad, I see it, but it's this weird, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm so excited, but whatever. Soon as he came out, it hit me like someone took a brick and threw it in my face. I remember, like, he came comes out, yeah. and it was like, cuckoo, like, oh. <gasps> Yeah. There's a baby. Like, yeah. this is real. It was such a weird 
experience for me. Now, each successive one, I get that connection faster and faster because I know what to expect. Uh, but I remember that first one, it hit me like... It now, do you, like I do you face. attribute that to because now this is going to be four for you and so it's each time? Or do you attribute that more just to being kind of older and more in tune like that? Because I wonder the same thing too, like, you know, uh, would, the, would the next one or the next one, would I be more and more connected earlier and earlier? Or are you just at that part in your life? Like, I don't know what some of the things you did with your first two kids versus what you did uh, now for baby three and four, like as far as when it was, when the baby was in the yeah. womb, like, I mean, I was like reading to Max when he was still in her belly yeah. and doing things like that and very, and very cognizant that there was a baby in there and talking to him and mm -hmm. rubbing where. Maybe if I was 25, I wouldn't be doing some of those. That's things. That's a good question. I don't know. I, I I have to say it's probably both, but it's the like, uh, you know, I had no idea is what it is. It's like you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So you know, okay, you remember before you had Max? Yeah. How Justin and I would say, and even Doug would say things like, "Oh, you'll know." Like it's hard for you to understand kind of what it feels like, but yeah. wait till you have one. Like that's what I mean. You ever talk to somebody without kids? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's it's, it's just you don't, and it's not. There's no. It's not bad or good. It's just you have no idea of what that's... It's like trying to explain... The magnitude of it, yeah. Yeah, it's like if you've never had vision before, so you've never had vision before, and you're trying to explain mm -hmm. to somebody what it's like to perceive things through vision. It's very hard to, to understand because you've never experienced it. You know, that, that's another thing that I didn't tell my cousin that I think that was new for me was this was the first time, and, you know the first time in my life I ever felt I truly loved something more than myself. Oh, you know, even my even Katrina being my partner, as much as I love her and would just would take a bullet for her and do anything for her, um, that it was different with Max. It was like the having a your kid took that to a whole new level. And I think you actually talked about how like it grows. Isn't that weird? Yeah, from the minute it comes out, it is like you feel that that feeling of like. And I think that had protection. To do, I also love. think that had to do with like the it's whole finance thing and why yeah. I got emotional at that is because like now like my mind is not on myself; it's a hundred percent on mm -hmm, him yeah. and thinking about him, which is why all of a sudden those weird feelings and decisions are happening. And it does; it grows as the time goes on. Yeah, sure. that's the part that, that, and it continues to grow. And then I remember having this thought with <clears throat> with having multiple was after I had my son, um, and then we were going to have another one. I thought. I almost felt a little worried. Like, am I going to love this one? Like I love yeah. my son. Like, how's that going to work? Like, what if I, I don't, what if I don't love her? Like I love my son. But what happens is it doesn't divide. It just grows. Yeah. Right? And each time it grows. I know Jessica is even talking about that with the second one for her. She's like, what if I don't love this one? Like I love Aurelius. I'm like, no, no, honey, just wait. Dude, just we, wait to experience I remember that. we had a moment and we were driving and this is when Courtney is pregnant with Everett and we were driving with Ethan. He was in the back seat and uh, he had, he had just been like talking a lot and like uh, learning ABCs and all this stuff. And he just started singing a song. And like, we were, we had that same thing. Are we going to love this other kid as much? And it was just <laughs> like, oh, it like, it like broke us down because it was just like, you know, you had this like new bond that you just made with this, this kid already. And then like, you know, you don't know if like it's going to take you away from that feeling or something and you're not going to give the yeah. same. I, it, it was a trip though. Yeah. It was just like, ah. Oh. The part that never gets old or hasn't gotten old for me is, and it's always shocking and surprising is the little, the like growth spurts in intelligence and yeah. personality. Yeah. Like right now, Aurelius is just randomly saying words. Yeah, yeah. Out of nowhere, like the other day, like we were, uh, what were we doing? We we're oh, he's got this. Um, okay, so we actually saw we we got them for you guys. Do you know those those? They're they look like big cards, but they're they're kind of smooth, and you can use a dry erase marker on them. The ones that Max had in, in Cabo, where you can like circle. Oh yeah, yeah. Objects, and it's yeah. pretty cool, right? So yeah. Jessica loved them, so we bought them for Aurelius. Yeah. And there's different pictures, and so they have to find like where's the apple, where's mm -hmm. the whatever. Mm -hmm. It's almost like where's Waldo, but it's made for little ones. Anyway. Um, He's like, he's pointing and he goes, cake. I'm like, you know how to say cake? You know, <laughs> tea. I'm like, what? Where's this coming from? Whale. Yeah. Like, where do you say all of a yeah, sudden yeah. all these different words? Like, what the hell? Now, do you guys, I was asking, my aunt and uncle are in town and they're watching Max right now because Katrina's out of town. So they're watching him while I'm at work. And uh, they they raised uh, six kids, right? So, and they have tons of grandkids. Each like each one of their kids have either like four or five kids. So they have like tons. Oh, I know this. Oh. this yeah. Uh, yeah, she loves. So I love they they're with them, and so obviously they've been around a lot of kids. And I'm like, I was asking my aunt last night. I'm like, what's your your favorite age like that of raising the kids at? And we, Max was puzzling in front of us and stuff like that. She's like, oh, probably this phase, this phase to six, so three to six range. I say that I, four to six is like what I think is yeah. the coolest time because. 
it to me that's when that that cognitive switch comes on. Like right now, Aurelius and Max are kind of starting to piece the words. Mm-hmm. And Max is now putting like three words together. He's that he's like just coming up on that new phase where he's soon going to be asking me why everything, yeah. right? Why, Daddy? Why this? Why that? And then that 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 switch where they're trying to piece everything together. I love that. Yeah, just mm-hmm. wait till they become uh, teenagers. It's really cool because they then you start to get uh, have deep discussions. You know, with little kids, you can't really have a deep discussion. Right. Mm-hmm. But now I'm having discussions with like my oldest and he'll challenge me or he'll come up with a concept or an idea. And it's cool to hear because I remember when I was his age, when I would think certain ways oh, or whatever. Yeah. So now it's like, oh, this is really cool. But then teenagers also, you know, they can, they can get, and I was the same way. Like you've learned a lot, but you don't have any wisdom, but you still think you have wisdom. So you, you have the, think you know a lot. That yeah. your parents so you don't. have the greatest range out of all of us. And of course, and I know everybody says that every phase presents, you know, things that are awesome yeah. that you like better than other phases. But if you had to pick a, you know, two or three year block of their lives so far, like what has been your. That's your so hard, dude, because you know what it is for me, at least, is when the phase is gone, I miss it. That keeps happening. So like if I think like, oh man, you know, 12 years, because my daughter's 12, about 13. Mm-hmm. I, oh, I missed that when my oldest was that age, you know? And then Aurelius is, you know, he's going to turn two in a few months or, and I'm and I and, and I'm like, man, I remember when he was one, you know? Or I, my cousin has an infant. Oh, I remember that. So it's like, I always miss what's gone and I don't know how to, I don't know. It's weird. It makes me want to be more present, but it's like, that's always going to happen. Yeah. It's like stupid Facebook with their constant... Uh, like, you know, Hey, remember this post seven years ago. And I see my kids when they were little and it's like, fucks me up every time. See, I kind of feel like I get that because there's definitely parts. Like one of the things that's, that is awesome about the first six months to a year is the sleeping on your chest all the time. Yeah. Like that's cool. Right. That was, I remember I had Max during football season. And so I got to watch football all day on Sunday and literally he would just sleep feed. Just cuddle with you. All day long. And that was a very rocking chair phase. But that being, and yeah, and I love that too. Like, I, you know, it's funny. I tell you guys this, I don't know if I talked about this on air the other day that I still every once in a while will go in and get Max and I'll rock him in the chair. (laughs) His legs are like dragging your body. (laughs) Just like that. Now does he stay there? I tried to pull it For a short while. So like. Every once in a while, because I do miss that face too, Justin, because I used to rock him to sleep forever. And, and I don't put him down as consistent Katrina normally does. Every once in a while, dad comes in and puts him down. And they'll be like, you want me to hold you? Yeah. He'll say, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And then I'll pick him up. And he's like, and I'm rocking him. Legs are all hanging down here. So that, and he's like trying to get comfortable. He's doing this. And he'll, and so I'll rock him for about maybe, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. And then eventually be, I could tell he's uncomfortable. And I'll be like, you want to get back in your bed? He'll be like, yeah, daddy. And so then I'll walk him back Dude, to his bed. You just wait. But I totally do that. You know, still. it's funny. I, so I'm a touchy feely person. Kind of like, I know you are too, Adam, but yeah. I, I, uh, I, I'll, I'll grab my mom and tease her and then I'll sit on the couch and have her sit on my lap. And I'll hold her, and, you know, squeeze her. And she, yeah. she, you know, she complains, but she likes it too. Yeah. So it's, it's a good time. What's that book? There's that book where the little kid is growing up and mom is holding him and taking care of him. And at the end of the book, mom's old. And Giving the, and, tree, right? I don't know. No, 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 that's not giving. Giving oh, trees with a tree, he keeps taking from the tree. Yeah, well, same one, concept. But, yeah. It messes me up. I hate that book. And then his mom's old and he's like putting her to bed. I'm like, oh, uh, come yeah, on, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I got to ruin me before dude. bedtime. Yeah. Hey, speaking of kids, do you guys know, I just read this the other day. Do you know what the record is for- how the most kids a single woman ever had? Oh, I don't know this. A single woman? So one woman throughout which, history. Well, yeah, throughout well recorded history. What we know it has to be yeah, like 20, one woman twenty something. Okay, so you say twenty something. What do you think, Justin? I don't know. Like yeah, I'll, I'll just say thirty to top Adam. Sixty nine. What? what? A woman. <laughs> a woman had sixty nine. Had to had multiple yes. like, triplets yes. and stuff. She had. She had. She would. She would kept having twins and triplets and then. Wow. Yeah. One woman had wow. sixty nine children. Her poor vagina. Uh, <laughs> either that or it's the strongest vagina of all time. Wow. Like, I don't know how you mean. And by the way, this was a long time ago. This wasn't like I got to pull it up. It's not like you know you get C sections left and right or whatever. Here, I'll Dude. read it. To you. Oh yeah, check this out. 69. What a champion! That's so many kids. The greatest officially recorded number of children born to one mother, sixty nine, to the wife of uh, Fyodor Vasiliev, a peasant from uh, Russia, in twenty seven confinements, she gave birth to sixteen pairs of twins. Seven sets of triplets and four sets of quadruplets. Whoa. Did yes. she ever have one child? I don't know, but I'm looking at a picture of her and all her children. She created an army. What year was this? 
Seventeen oh seven to seventeen eighty two. Uh, yeah, because I mean, um, this was all natural birth. Yes, natural. Because I was gonna say, like in vitro, a lot of times doesn't it happen where yeah. you get like twins? No, this and, was like, this was yeah, natural. this is way before that. Yeah, dude, and wow. they were all v vaginal deliveries. What an anomaly! Yeah, it's crazy. Wow, that's man. She I mean, how okay? So at some does point, it say, she, does it say at what age she stopped? She had to been having kids pretty late. Too. I mean, if she had to, right? I think at I, I mean at some point she must have gotten so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> that she was just like, oh, baby's coming. Boop. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the baby. I mean, yeah. at that point, you pretty much live your entire it's like life. A water pregnant. slide. Always pregnant. Always. <laughs> oh, water slide. <laughs> That's gross, dude. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. It's just what I'm thinking. <laughs> it's true. Hey, speaking of kids, did you guys know that in, in Hungary, uh, the country of Hungary, they passed a law a few years ago where if, a, if you had four kids, you no longer paid income tax? <laughs> what? Yeah. To promote uh, people having more kids. Yeah, you know, I want to, this is actually a good topic because there's this myth out there that the world is overpopulated, that we shouldn't have more kids. This is total bullshit. Totally. By the way, you could fit every human on earth in Texas and it yeah. would have the same population density of like a normal city. It's, it's like only a and it's only in like um, you know metropolitan like big cities where you see like this like crazy amount yes. of condensed people all in one place. But it's if you look at the map and like how much uh, space we have, it's it's insane how much. It's space not we just space; have. it's resources. For well, example, yeah. uh, oil, which is a very important resource. Still, we thought we would run out of it or hit peak oil in the 1970s, but because people are innovative found new ways to get more oil. We have more oil available today than we did back then, even if you do it per capita. So uh, resources, innovation, whatever. And this is why countries, so this is how you know that this is propaganda baloney when they say we need to like stop having kids or whatever. This is how you know it's full of crap. It, th if this were true, you wouldn't have countries like Italy, Japan, Hungary, um, uh, China. This is a big problem in China now because they're one child. Uh, yeah, policy. I was say, are they still one child only? No, they stopped it and now they're screwed okay. because now they're looking ahead and they're like, oh my God, this is going to be a yeah, problem. Didn't, they, didn't I, did I read somewhere like by 2040 or 2030, like the population will be cut in half or something? 21, 2100, I think. Oh, 2100. Yeah, so it'll be cut years, in half. Almost 100 years. Um, years. Yeah, so no, we need more people for innovation. We need more people to pay into systems that take care of older people. Uh, it's this is it's not a bad thing. I'm sure at some point there's, we're gonna hit a, we're gonna hit where we have too many, but that's we're not nowhere close to that. So well, yeah, so no much of tax. our uh, I mean, we rely on our consistent growth in our GDP in order for everything to work. Like look out, look how everyone we're freaking out right now because you have two quarters of negative GDP. Like imagine if it's the not a recession though anymore, Adam. Yeah, yeah. No. It, it, because what they didn't identify it as one. Did I yeah. did I hear that they that they changed it and then Wikipedia? I heard you say that they locked it out. They changed the de uh, recession is always meant two quarters of contraction, so mm -hmm. negative GDP growth, which we have. The White House comes out, changes the definition. It's on the White House website, and then Wikipedia changed the definition and locked it so nobody could edit it out. So, Very convenient how these things start just changing definitions all of a sudden. Yeah. Like that's happening across the board for a lot of you Did you listen to the newest All In podcast already? I did. What did they say about it? That's what they said. They said it's a joke. They said we're, we're in recession, 100%. I mean, I would. how yeah. dangerous do why you Why not be honest is? about by it? Not say, by not telling everybody. Oh, that. the reason why it's dangerous is because then the Fed chair comes out and basically, you know, they raised interest rates, but then po paints a rosy picture. So this means that investors now are, 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 you know, they, cause they base it off of what they say too. Right. And the, and the way that they say it. So investors are like, Oh, um, green light again. Yeah. I guess they're not going to keep raising rates. Remember in the night in night, I don't know, was it was 1984. I want to say no, before that Volcker, the chair of the fed back then we had inflation like we do now. They raised interest rates. It was like in double digits. That but was they, in the 70s, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was early eighties. Oh, I thought it was late 70s. And in the seventies is when the inflation was bad, right? Yeah. Under Carter. So what they did is they crushed inflation. We went into a really bad recession that lasted a year, but then the following year we had explosive growth because, you know, the markets became more accurate and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, but, and right now they're, they're afraid of going up to like, you know, 4%, 5%. I, mean, I think they hit like 15, 16, 17% back then to crush inflation. So, wow. well, it, now what I'm curious about, because I've heard that if you actually calculated inflation the same way you calculate inflation then. Oh, we're double digit. 
Yeah. They did that too. They played a little shell game too with uh, how, how we, you how, calculate it. Yeah. Mm. They changed it. Like they pulled, there's certain Sneaky. things that are not included in when they, when they factor in like, like fuel is yeah, not in gas there. Gas and food aren't even in there. Yeah. Like how is that not in there when that's what's, what most what people are feeling right on. now. Yeah. Most people are going to the grocery store or going to the gas station and this is where they feel inflated. Maybe Doug, you can find when they changed how they calculated inflation because fuel and food used to be in there and then they took them out. Uh, to obviously, this is all again. It's a shell game, right? It's like yeah. how can we change the numbers to make people feel a particular way? Because yeah, if you add those in, we're in double digit inflation. Uh, I think like was it like fifteen, sixteen percent? If you throw those in, yeah, I know it's yeah. really weird. That's yeah, maybe Doug, Doug. What does it say there about when we changed? I don't see the date that we changed that, but it's definitely not included. Food and energy sectors are not included. Yeah, no, I know it's not included. Because they say it's too volatile. It's so stupid. It, <laughs> that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. It makes us look bad. Maybe you could put when did they change when did they change uh the how they calculate inflation? Because I want to see um oh there you go. Look, it's one of the top searches. 1983. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, because why? Yeah. Because that's when there was huge inflation. Yeah, yeah. Right, after the, right after the 70s. Dude, dude speaking of kids, you want to hear something? That, I, I thought this was a fake story. This is your third speaking of kids. You had a lot of kids stuff. I, yeah. I know. It all worked out. <laughs> kids, kids, kids. It all worked out together. This has got to be the craziest thing I've ever read. And it's because I said this is not real. Oh, no, it's real. Jackie sent something over that I wanted to talk about, too. I thought it was really Okay, check this out. Ready for this? Yeah, let's hear it. Okay. First of all, I'll read the title of this. Uh, and it's this is a real thing. So the title of the article is Japanese officials assassinate the leader of a baby stealing monkey gang. <laughs> Whoa, what? what? <laughs> well, okay. Say that again. Baby stealing? Like they were like. Japanese officials assassinate the leader kids? of a baby stealing monkey gang. A city in Japan is on the lookout after dozens of people have been attacked by monkeys. Now, when I first read that, I thought that there was a gang of people. Stealing baby monkeys? No, it's a gang of monkeys. Okay, because I seen a clip uh, before of this, and in, in, in the video they said that they were having this issue where they had like a monkey that they thought like somebody was sending the monkey out to grab and snatch kids, and they were thinking it was a sex trafficking thing. Okay, so which check was this out. Like really disturbing. So for the past several weeks, the southern Japanese city of Yamaguchi has been under siege by a gang of wild macaques. <laughs> you love saying that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you can't watch out for macaques. Hey. For, by, by a gang of wild macaques hell bent on stealing babies and attacking women and the elderly. The troop of marauding snow monkeys has evaded capture while terrorizing residents. Dude, Planet and, of the Apes is happening, you and guys. This, oh, dude. And, and, and while terrorizing residents and is thus far responsible for over 50 violent incidents that include break ins and assaults in homes, schools, and even a kindergarten. Bro, most that, notably, what is going on with with this behavior? Look at this. Most notably, however, have been the numerous attempts at kidnapping small children. What? So you know what the freaking you know what they did? They went and assassinated the leader of the gang of this Jeff <laughs> of this uh, macaque gang. Wow, <laughs> dude, this is crazy. How big are these monkeys? Isn't that a, say wasn't that in a movie where they had like a pet monkey that was like a thief and he would send yeah. it? Yeah, right. That's in a movie. Oh, isn't that's it? Indiana Jones. No, not the car. <laughs> it, it's, it's <laughs> Indiana Jones, dude. Raise the Lost Ark. There's another. There's. A, I guess maybe they've done it multiple times. And because yeah. you're right, Aladdin did it. So, so did Justin, you were wondering how big macaques are. Uh, <laughs> I was because um, macaques are 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 normal size monkeys, but they're monkeys, bro. Uh, monkeys are strong as shit. I know? guess that's okay. I was hoping they're huge. <laughs> did you see the one? That, okay, <laughs> change, <Justin. laughs> change the subject. Yeah, Doug, can you pull up uh, Hershey's ticker? I want to see what their stock oh, is. Wow. I want to see what their stock is right now. I might have I might have a little prediction for you. For Where are we going here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you see the article that Jackie sent over? I think this is this was a candy shortage. Yes. Oh, God. So Hershey's came out with Hershey's came out with an article saying that they are preparing for a huge shortage come Halloween and Christmas, which is when they have the biggest spike in in sales for you know chocolate bars and candy and all the other candies that they they make and own. Where, where's the short? Like what the ingredients? ingredients? Because I don't know what exact what ingredients to make certain certain candy, but a lot of their different popular. <laughs> it's up. Oh, look at that. Wow. Look at that. Wow. Watch it continue to run too. Because of course, okay, think about this. Remember, when the, the, remember, remember when the toilet paper shortage uh, came out? Everybody bought. So man, imagine how brilliant. Chocolate. I kind of feel like this is like brilliant strategy yeah, if you're say, a Hershey's. Because this, is this is a little early to be talking about Halloween candy, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, we got a few months before you're going to be buying Halloween and Christmas what candy. What ingredient is it that they're lacking? I don't know exactly. what. Exactly. I don't like, know what, what the exact. Maybe you can look it up. Of listen, sugar out there. Listen, okay, not many things will get Americans up in arms, but a candy shortage? 
That's a civil war. That's shit it, right there. man. Yeah. That's, that's where I draw. I want to look up the article because I want to see what it is that people that they're saying is going to cause uh, this shortage. It's yeah. a it, it, yeah. It's there's an ingredient, an ingredient or multiple ingredients in making Hershey chocolate bars, and I think Jolly Ranchers and yeah. some other. Ones I'm not even a fan. Of internationally, chocolate. wasn't it just grains specifically well, that we're worried about? Uh, uh, it's more than that, dude. It's more than that. It's not just that's the main one. I think that everybody's concerned about, but there's more than that that there's shortages. Oh, here of. I'm pulling it up right now. But mm. I mean, Hershey's owns a lot of candies. They're not just. It's not. It's oh, you yeah. get a Hershey chocolate bar yeah. right away, and that's it. But they that's have true. a bunch of different oh. brands underneath their brand. It's the okay, case. Supplies of cocoa. Edible oil and other food ingredients. There okay. you go. So that's what's happening. Well, okay. I tell you what, man. We, we ran out of candy. Americans are going to be pissed. I mean, gas goes yeah. up. Everybody, like, I know whatever. it's up right now. No I candy. Think, I think it's a good buy. I think it's a good buy. Sure. It's going to be a good buy until the end of the year. So watch it. Watch it go on a run. Holy cow, man! Yeah, because they'll, they'll probably they'll probably increase prices, and then people will still go buy it all out of stock. Stacking Hershey bars, yeah, people dude. will freak out and not yeah. have candy on Halloween, so we'll Whatever. start that's buying even, in August. That's not even my favorite candy. I could care less. Are you guys chocolate? I'm not a big. Well, what are, are you how many brands? Sorry, Doug, I'm gonna put you to work here. How many brands Reese's, are underneath dude. Hershey? They're, they're that's a big company. They're not just hurt. It's not. It's not just chocolate. Listen, bars. if I can't get candy corn for Halloween, I'll is be Reese's a, a, attached to? I think so. <laughs> Look at Justin's. I know. I think Hershey's. I'm pretty sure Hershey owns Reese's. I think. <laughs> I think. Justin, I don't know that. Justin Maybe just Doug, got Doug, Doug can fact check. <laughs> More than ninety brands, bro. That's the only your candy favorite candy is probably under Hershey. Look at look up. I what want, do we got? What do we got? I'm all about candy corn on Halloween. Yeah, you like all the weird stuff. I like know. The, the do you know that? Do you know there's two Hershey factories in the United States? That's it. One of them used to be in my hometown. One is in Pen- one's in Pen- one's in Pennsylvania, one's in Oakdale. Oakdale, and then they closed down the Oakdale one. But when it used to rain in Oakdale, the whole town would smell like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. That's awesome. It was the coolest. It was like one of the coolest things. Yeah. Like, like this this little shithole town out in the middle of nowhere. We had the Hershey plant there, and so anytime it like rained, the whole town would smell like a chocolate candy <laughs> stick bar. Your yeah, face sorry, in Justin. Ah. Reese's is part of the group. Millions of Reese's cups just disappear. It is. No. Look at it. Oh, yeah, dude. You're gonna have to make your own uh, Jolly Ranchers, Twizzlers. Who likes? Twizzlers? I gotta get a bunker. You guys. Twizzlers is still a thing. Twizzlers are gross. They're Did not even. Post- they're not even licorice. Did you see the meme I posted yeah, about it the other day? I posted a meme about Red Twizzlers. Vines way better. Red yeah. Vines way better yeah. than yeah. Twizzlers. Yeah, yeah. Twizzlers. I don't understand. Agreed. Agreed. Twizzlers taste like plastic. Yeah, no. If you ask me, well, well they got like a lot of different candies artificial under butter there. plastic under their. Uh, oh, I didn't know they do Skinny Pop too, huh? That's and, gotten really uh, popular. Bro, Pirates booty. Don't say that out loud, Adam. Booty. Skinny too. pop. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> who who eat, who eats popcorn instead of candy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, since we're on this, uh, you imagine handing out popcorn to kids at Halloween. That's a great way to get your, your house egged. No, I just didn't know they own that. I didn't know they own that brand. That's a, that's, a, that's a really popular brand right now. You know, I'm going to stay on the kids theme because you we have a commercial today uh, for public goods, and I just we were, the other day we were talking about uh, Max. And, and it really is like incorporating them and helping out. So, uh, I mean, almost all of our products now in the house are pretty close to being all public goods now. And we have all, and then we have a storage where we have like all the refillable, you know, yeah. stuff or whatever. And that's like one of his new favorite things to do is to go around the house and fill all the soap bottles and the lotions oh, that's cute. and stuff like that. And so Katrina lets him carry it. You know, we talk a lot about chemicals that could be potential endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens and stuff like that. Those are a lot of the chemicals that public goods tries to watch out for and prevent uh, from being in their products. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, because you know, it could be really overwhelming if you're like, okay, what chemicals could potentially affect my hormone system and in what combinations or whatever? Public Goods provides lots of these products, mm-hmm. and they make they, that's one of their targets. Is we don't we don't sell products that have a lot of these known chemicals that can cause hormone disruptions yeah. and stuff like that. Along with the fact that they're uh, you know environmentally conscious, very environmentally conscious. Well, and so. they're direct to consumer, and so I give you buy products like Public Goods because it's not like they're the only product that does this stuff. You're you're the price you're paying. Like you go to Whole Foods and you go get their dish soap. You get those things. That yeah, are, chemical free. Yeah, yeah, you're paying so much more than like your normal soap or lotion or things yeah. like that. Where I, my lotion and soap, hand soap, all those things are actually cheaper through Public Goods, and it's a better product than like your basic Safeway brands. Mm. Oh, that they have. I, I got to tell you guys. Speaking of our, I didn't even tell you guys. Speaking of our sponsors, I have. I got a DM from someone whose family um, makes wine. So they oh. make wine, they have a vineyard, Interesting. but they've always had such a bad reaction to alcohol that they can never really partake in, you know, the family events. And, and they stuff. own a winery. That well, sucks. Because, yeah, irony. you know, yeah. it, 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 and they can, they have a little bit, but yeah. in the DM, they're like, you know, if I drink a glass or more, I always feel so terrible the next day. So I never was really able to enjoy. I heard you guys talk about Z-Biotics oh. and I said, let me give this a try and see if this makes a difference. And it did. 
Wow. It did. They're like, I, you know, they're like, look, I'm not getting smashed. They're like, I'm just having a glass or two with my family now. But now I feel the next day okay. I don't feel like I did before. Yeah, that's which is kind of cool, right? That, that is cool. I, the, the wine has been one of those where it's been always difficult for me because I think it's because of the added additives and things that I guess like some wines have some of the cheaper wines because mm. I've always had I think some of the cheaper wines and then I just got like introduced to some of the more you know expensive stuff that's the good stuff and I, and I didn't have the same reaction at all mm. but i mean z-box of course that helps you know yeah. overall with you know you feeling the, better the, the worst day. hangover i ever had in my entire life was wine yeah well that's what i mean that always gave me the worst i was when i was that's in, to do the sugar i think uh i don't i don't know what it is or if it's because yeah, it's dark like cheap cheap wine is really really high on sugar a lot of times oh it, dude i had a, that's a, that, don't they a have lot like, of like fillers and, and a lot of the cra- a too? lot of the crash we feel aside from like i know what uh, what z-biotic pairs with in order to like eliminate that but yeah. a lot of the crash you feel is the the spike in the in, blood, in sugar. blood sugar and then it's the dramatic crash doug what is it so that they you, add to wine here that they don't add in like europe sulfates, sulfates. sulfates. that can cause That's people what, to have yes. allergic uh like like immune reactions that one got me a bit yeah no i there was i was in my 20s and my cousin and i he had just broken up with his girlfriend he's really sad and we bought went to the grocery store you know in your 20s you don't pay attention to like quality you're just like this is let's get smashed so i bought you ever seen those jugs of wine? They try to make them look old world, mm-hmm. but they're in the grocery store. So mm-hmm. it's like a jug. Yeah. So him and I split a jug one night and just crushed it. <laughs> and I had a hangover that lasted two days. I uh-huh. never felt a hangover uh-huh. that bad in my entire it, life. Dude. It was yeah. the worst. Do you think, okay, so you've talked to the guys, right, at Z-Biotic. And do, uh, I don't know if you know the science behind this or not, but if you kind of regularly, like let's say you're somebody who kind of drinks occasionally or like maybe a couple of drinks on the weekend or whatever like that, and you consistently use Z-Biotic, is, do you think there's a compounding effect that and a residual that stays in there so it continues to kind of help Oh, you? that's a good question. Like, for I example, like I, I, I actually noticed the other day, I didn't have, I remember I had a beer at work and that's like a total <laughs> never happens, <laughs> ever happened. That was weird. <laughs> yeah. That was awkward. Did we get that on camera? Well, you know, I think, like... it, I think it was. I think I think Andrew caught a clip of it or whatever, but it's because Justin did that stupid commercial, like, yeah. I don't know, two, three weeks ago. We've had those Corona lights sitting in our refrigerator for a long time and I was eating like a homemade burrito bowl and I'm like, you know what sounds really good <sighs> right now? I've been drinking so much of that Sevia and I'm like, I don't want that right now. I'm like, maybe I'll have that Corona light. Oh, Corona kind of light good. Mexican food? So like it's like hard to calories. resist. Like yeah. whatever. Yeah. So it went really good. But anyways, I didn't have Z-Biotic because we don't have any here right now. Thanks, Justin. And I drank it and actually felt totally fine, which normally sometimes even a single I'll beer make a will make you feel it, off. So I wonder if there's... I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know how long the bacteria lives in your gut because what it does is uh, the bacteria is in your gut and it produces compounds that break down the acetaldehyde that doesn't make it to yeah. the liver. Yeah. So it prevents you getting all this acetaldehyde. You'll have to ask about Well, th- this is going to launch like afterwards. But uh, so today we're, we're launching a, a commercial for Zbiotics on the, uh, Instagram. And it's all about like uh, the Mind Pump Mule. So it's like the formula that oh, I oh, use yeah. for yeah my recipe. Hey, welcome back. We're going to learn how to make the Mind Pump Mule. For you know, you ruined, you ruined Moscow Mules for me. Yeah. I, I, I have yet to have a Moscow no, I Mule. I enhanced your Moscow Mule. Well, what I mean by that is <laughs> yeah. I have yet to have a Moscow Mule anywhere yeah. that's as good oh, as the one I agree, make. I agree. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's Justin tough. makes it with love. Yeah. That's <laughs> he actually does. That's what Katrina says. Like when food's like really good, <laughs> I made it with love. Well, you ever watch a very him? specific way, yeah. yeah, yeah he I does do this it. thing with the, uh, what is the leaves you put in there? Mint. 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 Okay. He takes the mint and he's, he claps his hands. Yeah, you express the oil, man. Express the mint. I have no idea. I had no idea what you were doing. I just thought it was a weird ritual. Like, yeah. let's just put some magic in there. It's like quick. Daniel Sutter. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Karate Karate yeah, makes yeah, Miyagi. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I want, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so uh, the, it was kind of a funny thing. I was think like I was reading about um, inventions and like some, uh, you know, childhood toys and things that like people have come up with. And uh, you remember the super soaker, right? Yeah. yeah. Like the most like the coolest uh, you know, water gun of all time. Can we pause there for a second? Yeah. Because people don't know this who are not our our age. The super soaker revolutionized the water gun market. Yeah. I remember as a kid. No, it did. Yeah. As a kid, you had two options. The water weenie, which was terrible. The water weenie was the only one that would give yeah, you a continual awful. stream, yeah. right? But you had to hold this big ass. It was like tube. the hose before that, right? Yes. All you had to just and then the other ones were just squirt, squirt, squirt. And that was it. And then the super soaker came out and it was like it was like having a machine Domination, gun against dude. muskets. Actually, yeah. yeah, I would love to look that up. Doug, can you pull up how much money the original super soaker made? Because you're right. That was like- it revolutionized water it gun was, fights. It was insane, dude. It took over. It swept. So anyway, like- 
You want to talk about the the most overqualified person ever to invent this? I just I'll give you a guess as to like what his uh, profession was. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so you're saying who invented the super yeah, soaker? Who you know what it is? The super soaker. Yeah. Oh, was he an wow. astrophysicist or something? <laughs> Very close. Really? Yeah, yeah. nuclear uh, scientist, nuclear <laughs> physicist. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. This guy Lonnie Johnson, I guess. Like, Imagine going to school for that, probably working at NASA for brilliant. a while, something like yeah. that. And yeah. then your big breakthrough is you make the super soaker. Yeah. But oh, is this him? Crushed right here? it. Is this him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Lonnie he Johnson. He has a net Mark worth Andrew. of three hundred million. Yeah. Wow. wow. And a fortune thanks to the invention of the Super Soaker. Wow. Lager. The Super in the Soaker early was the 90s. best selling toy in the U.S. in the early 90s and generated well over $1 billion in revenue. $1 <laughs> billion? For a plastic toy. Ooh. I need to, I mean, okay, we can't. It's like the best this. thing he's done. He's a nuclear. Like, yeah, I know. It's so funny. Just, you would be remembered for that. You know, know? That's isn't crazy. that funny how yeah. markets work? Like he could have used his uh, his intelligence to like solve some like major problem. Yeah, right. Yeah. Invents a water gun. I'll tell you what though, I, I can't overstate this. When when I was a kid, it's still like this, right? Water gun fights were a big thing in my neighborhood. Summertime comes out. Yeah, yeah. We're all blasting each other. We're getting water balloons. We're having oh, a yeah. good time. When the super soaker hit the scene, it was literally like it would be like. It would be like you're an army and you're on horseback with muskets and then they show up with tanks and, and machine guns. Yeah. It was game over. Yeah, and I remember yeah. the first kid with the you super soaker. Destroyed oh, we're getting our asses one. kicked. And I'm like, Dad, we need to go buy I think one. I, I, think, yeah. I think as a kid, I think I got, for it was for me, almost a decade of my life, it was like one of the mo one of the toys I asked for almost every year. Because you know why? What they did was also brilliant is they evolved it every year. Yeah. Oh, it kept double so, super Yeah, soaker, the double yeah, pumper, yeah. then the yeah. backpack. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the like, bazooka. Like, yeah, right. dude, it just kept getting crazier and crazier. You're like, I need I that like, one. Yes, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gatling guns. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the water weenie was cool because it was better than what else, whatever they had, but that thing got was... You know another one I remember? that we I did, So the uh, the water balloons that were like grenades. Yes. You remember those? I had oh, those. Oh, they look like grenades? Yeah. Bro, we had and, those. We'd go in the forest and like it was like all on assault. You I would actually, this is where I got into some trouble because I would actually like create like booby traps and things. I dug like holes and I would put part of the, the forest has like a thick layer of like, um, you, you know, like fallen leaves, whatever. And it creates this kind of thick yeah. brush. And so I could easily like put that on top of the hole and I would have like these huge pits of like um, water balloons and whatever. And one of the kids fell and I dug one really deep and he like hurt himself. Of course, dude. Like, like, what was I thinking? Oh, we so all did. Going like back that. to your super soaker, because I'm like super fascinated that somebody was able to invent something like this and make a run that long, make that much money, right? And increase his net worth. He had to have some sort of a patent on that because it would be such a, in, it would be such an easy thing to recreate a different mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. So he must have. Yeah, uh, but the, what can you patent with something like that? Probably some, some the, the water pressure, like with yeah. the um, yeah the pump. So somehow. okay, I'm gonna I have a theory. So there was a toy that used a similar technology before the super soaker. It wasn't a water gun though, and you guys will remember it as soon as I bring it up. Okay, first water gun patent was issued in 1986. Another patent. Okay, so what did he do? And it described further air pressure it, instead of water pressure. That's part of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was that the? It was the first one to use air pressure like that. Yeah, yeah. but I remember because the, the old school method is was water pressure. Yeah, the old school you'd have to pull the trigger each yeah, time you, you scored it. This you so pump air, the water, and then that was it, yeah. right? So I you there have was, a chamber of air that you. There, there yeah, was a toy that used air pressure that is older than the super soaker. It wasn't a water gun. Let's see if you guys can remember. It was a very common toy. The rocket. The rocket. Yeah, oh, right, right. Remember the rockets? I had yep. one. I you pump those. them and you let go and it just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I remember those. You ever fire those at your friends? I mean, I bet you that's probably, <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. I wonder if that's where he got it from, but that's, yeah, because now, I mean, you bought those guns, right? That are like a knockoff version of the brand. Yeah, now they exist. I wonder if the patent expired. Yeah, exactly. Is, is, is it the patents expired or the people found ways around the patent yeah, maybe by now? Because now you see all kinds of competitive products. But I mean, for someone to get away with a run for that long and you not make a competitive product, you had to have had what's a pretty the most, tight patent. What's the most powerful yeah. super soaker now? What do they look like now? I want to see what that looks like. Doug, can we look that up? <sighs> The yeah, most power. Like I'm sure they, like someone's got a battery, like a, a bad battery or CO2 loaded. CO2? I would imagine. CO2? Oh, CO2, yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. wouldn't you I wouldn't you think that, right? Like well, you, you've seen all the CO2 uh BB guns and like oh, dude. Did you see the new one Matt Best just just yes. did a, yeah, it's Instagram it's like post on? Fully automatic. Dude. What is it? Pull this up, Doug. Pull up, go to Matt Best Instagram. Sorry, we're like sending you all over the place right I now. No, it's like an AR fifteen kind of looking. Go to go to uh Instagram, go to Matt Best. And go to like maybe a post he just did about two days ago. And yeah, yeah, that's him. Go what down, is it? go down, watch this. You have to see this, Sal. 
There it is, right there. It's that first one, actually. Yeah. Play this for Sal. And what is that? That's a. It's a fully it's a BB automatic gun. BB gun. Oh no! But wait till you see like the. So I don't have one of those, but I have the hand I'm uh, guns, these, like the Glocks. So I have like. And I bet that's they've a come a long way. How much? You wanna, guns, how much you want to bet you can't buy that in California? How much you want to bet you oh. can't buy that here? <laughs> and it's a BB gun. And it's, and it's like not even in California. Watch him fire this thing right here. Yeah. And it's a BB gun. Those are all little, like cans, right? Just watch the cans. No. Can yep. we get a bunch of those? You I know. I'm. I'm so ready stuff. to get one of those. I want four. Yeah. <laughs> I want all of us to have one. Yeah. Can we do that? Talk about like you know getting rid of my gopher problem. Yeah. <laughs> you saw that already too, yeah? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. saw it right away. I was like, Are they oh. for sale, or is it just he made it himself? No, no, no. He got the company. He's not yeah. sponsored by the company. He says that in his video. Just friends of theirs sent it to them, and he pulled it out and it just displayed it. And it's well. Hold on a second. If the company's watching right now and you'd like some free, <laughs> <laughs> you'd like us to talk yeah, about wheel and deal yeah, here. Yeah, 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 send yeah, yeah. us yeah, some. Don't uh, say the name of the brand. We're bro. fans. We don't say it yet, but we will say it if you send it to us. <laughs> send us some fully automatic BB guns. We'll take those. <laughs> Hey, real quick, uh, there's a company we work with called Live On, Live On Labs, and they make some of the best supplements uh, you'll find anywhere. But here's the deal. They have a patented liposomal delivery process, meaning these ingredients actually get to the target tissues. This is a pharmaceutical uh, delivery system, but it's in a supplement, okay? And right now, you can get lipoglutathione for free when you bundle it with the B-complex and vitamin C. Go check this company out. This is where I take my nutrients. This is where I get my glutathione. This is where I get my alpha lipoic acid, where I get my B-complex. I don't take that stuff anywhere else. I get it from Live On Labs. Again, get free lipoglutathione only for Mind Pump listeners when you bundle it with the B-complex and the vitamin C. Here's what you got to do, though. Go to liveonlabs.com forward slash MP for that hookup. All right, here comes the show. Our first caller is Thomas from Mississippi. Thomas, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, so uh, happy to be on the podcast. I've been listening to y'all for about a year and a half now. My question was about the dangers of red meat. So last year, I started eating myself a pound of red meat every day. And once I started doing that, everybody started telling me how terrible that was for me. Uh, what I don't understand is that if one gram of red meat is more micronutrient dense than one gram of white meat and the fat content in red meat is better than white meat. Why is there so much hate on eating all this red meat? Where do you live? Beverly Hills? Is that, uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, Actually. Depends. So there's two, two parts of this. First, let me address. Is it bad for you? Uh, depends, uh, depends on the person. So, and, and I don't know the whole context. So I would say, Depending on the individual, uh, most people would be fine, but a lot. Some people might have blood lipids that would look a little off, or maybe get inflamed um, from eating so much of one particular type of food. It's unlikely, but if you get you know your checkups done and your health is good and you feel good, you're totally fine. As far as why it gets all the all the, all the hate, uh, because it's been it was it, yeah, it was based on faulty science. There was this. Mm -hmm. Saturated fat cholesterol model that was put out. I think it was a seven nation study that was put out and was accepted as dogma for as to why there's uh, heart disease exploding in, in developed nations. We all know that that now uh, was totally faulty. It doesn't really work that way. Um, there's a lot more to the story than just, you know, people eat a lot of fat, you know, type of deal. So because red meat tends to be higher in saturated fat and fat in general, everybody was like, oh, um, that's bad for you. So let's all eat the lean meat which is like chicken breast and you know lean turkey meat. Don't eat the brown turkey meat. Eat the lean white turkey meat. And you know when you eat eggs, eat just the egg whites and all that stuff. And so it was based off of uh, faulty science. Really, the, the, most of the danger of red meat uh, occurs when you uh, hunt the red meat. That's when it's dangerous. <laughs> other, than <Yeah>. that, <laughs> other than that, you're probably okay. Or it's what you pair it with. That's really what ends up happening is the people that are eating high red meat. All right, sorry, go ahead. No, it's it's normally what uh, what they're pairing it with, too. So if you're getting your red meat from McDonald's because you're eating a large fry and a milkshake right. with it, that's where it gets bad. This is what always tarnishes right. a lot of those studies. You know, they don't account for a lot of those other factors that sneak in there in terms of, like, what they combine their red meat with. But, you know, there's I'm sure there's some outliers out there that don't do very well with red meat. So I'm sure that exists. Yeah. But. That's a, you're, now, what Justin and Adam are referring to is, like, the healthy buyer, uh, healthy user bias, where... Because we've been told for so long that red meat is bad for us, that people who are health conscious 
now tend to avoid, or a lot of people who are health conscious now tend to avoid red meat because we've been told for so long. And so what happens is when you do a study and you don't have really good controls, you go, oh, look, people who eat less re red meat tend to be healthier. But that's because these tend to be health conscious people. If I, if I put out you know, a message that riding a bike is bad for your health, and I do that for five decades, uh, eventually healthy people are going to avoid riding a bike. And then we're going to have studies that show that, oh, people who don't ride a bike tend to be healthier. So you got to be careful with that. But when you have all the controls put in place, it doesn't work out that way. Not at all. Now, they're always outliers. There's outliers that will have bad reactions to vegetables and fruit also. Mm -hmm. Yep. But for the most part, it's totally fine. Um, and there's countless examples. I mean, you want some anecdote. Like I eat a pound of red meat and eight to 10 eggs a day. And my cholesterol numbers are, um, I mean, what, what would be considered uh, perfect um, based off of the, you know, the standards. But yeah, I wouldn't worry so much. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you know what your blood work looks like? Your, your triglycerides, your health markers, inflammatory markers? Do you know any of that? Uh, I don't right now. I know that next week. I have okay. an appointment next week. Okay. So, I mean, if you get checked and everything looks okay and you feel good, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about, um, you know, red meat. I, I, like I said, it was all based off of bullshit, really. Yeah. And to like Adam and Justin's point about like what, like all the studies always show it paired with, by the way, you know, they say processed red meat or it's like, I'm not eating like my ground beef, I'm not eating it with McDonald's fries and a Dr. Pepper. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You're not smoking a cigarette with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all, and people hate on it whole eggs so much too. I don't, I don't know. I like to eat whole eggs and the, the quantity people tell me is a lot too. Yeah, no, that's, this Where is, are these people? This is a <laughs> dinosaur stuff. This is really, <laughs> this is a big ship that is hard to turn. You're looking at decades of messaging. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to bring this up on, um, in, on another episode or maybe even this one, um, when we record the front part of it, but there was a study that came out showing that the, the dietary guidelines of America, which is, a, it's like a council who dictate our dietary guidelines and policy and, and a lot of regulations, 95% of the people on there had uh, significant conflicts of interest. So, and I'll tell you, if you followed the government's guidelines for health over the last four decades, you'd be sick and obese right yeah. now. So that's way more alarming to me. Yes, totally. So I, I think you're fine, but you get your blood work, it checked. Every individual is different. So I can't make a definitive statement, but generally speaking, red meat's one of the healthiest foods you could find on earth. Huh? All right. Thanks yeah. for calling in. Man. Thanks, Sean. Approved. You got it. Boy, that's a, that's so annoying to me. The 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 messaging that I still know. There's still people who are like um, who are telling me that margarine is healthier than butter. Just reminds <laughs> you, right? That, the information, that yeah, the information that's still out there that we heard decades ago is just like it's still within the pop culture. Well, how many views? Do you know how many views uh, Game Changers got? What, no I mean, idea. I I, it's it went, it went crazy viral. Oh, that so. documentary definitely made an impact. Yeah, yeah. it Big made time. a huge impact. I mean, I had family that I remember seeing not not long after it released that all of a sudden were, you know, cutting out you know red meat out of their diet completely. And when I was like, what 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 are you doing? Oh, did you see the game changer document? And I'm like, oh my god, yeah. dude. You know what's funny too is that you'll get people like that who will cut out red meat, and then they'll be like, I'm way healthier. Look at my my look at my blood work, and you're like, okay, so here's what you did. You traded your higher caloric intake meat That's for right. lower. And so what you did is you cut your calories. Right. Yeah. It's just like when people are like, exactly. oh, I don't eat any carbs. Look what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Or I cut or out I introduced more fiber into my diet. Yes. And therefore, now my digestion feels better. Yes, because just eating lower calorie tends to improve things, regardless of what your diet's made up. Lane of. did a really good, he wrote a paper and he did a whole video on like every point that Game Changers yes. made and just destroyed it. Like he went, I, I think it was a long, it was literally a long, it's a long paper to read, Yeah. but I mean, he went thorough. Like he went at every single point they tried to make in there and unpacked it for the audience. I thought it was a, probably one of the best papers and, and videos done on Game Changers for anybody who still believes that or thinks that the stuff that they were promoting was true. What was it? What was the views? How viral did it go? It's supposedly one of the most watched documentaries of all time. Wow. What? Wow. Really? Yeah, you could Man, you could argue that, that, about a, <laughs> that that's having that's having one of the greatest impacts on that that narrative right now. Yeah, yeah. but you know what happens? It's propaganda. What happens is people switch because they're they were they're they're 
they, they've been scared to, right? So they watch that. Oh my God, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to die. I want to be healthy. Then they switch. And then within six months, the fail rate is like, like any other diet and they go right back. Yeah, um, yeah. So the only people that stick to it are the ones that really believe in, you know, the welfare of animals, don't want animals to be killed. Mm -hmm. But if that's not you cutting out meat because it's healthier, it's, th that's not true. That's false. That's not how it's it works. Losing strategy. It's the only people who I think should cut it out. Yes, it really is. I mean, I, I, I totally support somebody who does that. That's fine. I yep. got nothing wrong, nothing against totally. that. But otherwise, why the hell would you? It's like some of the best part of my diet. Oh, yeah. It's delicious. It's, it's, I, I, I would miss it immediately. Yeah, yeah, I know. And no I'm, more ribeyes? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. And it's, and it's, and it's a fact. No. It's extremely nutrient-dense, and it's one of the last whole foods that Americans have in their diet. If you look at Americans' diet, 70% yeah. is heavily processed foods. If you look at the 30% that's whole, it's usually meat eggs or milk. Mm -hmm. So you cut out meat, what are you going to replace that with? More heavily processed yeah, foods. That's it. It ain't going to be carrots. <laughs> <laughs> carrots in the shape of uh, ribeye. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Our next caller is Aaron from Virginia. Aaron, what's happening? How can we help you? Good. How's it going, guys? Good. Good. Um, so my main question is uh, I'm starting to kind of try to fix my metabolism after uh, – several years of not really paying too much attention to what I've been eating or how much just kind of working out as hard as I can, not tracking on protein or minimal tracking on protein. Um, so like I started a little background on me, like I started with CrossFit about 12 years ago. Um, that kind of got me into a lot of the lifting, power lifting, stuff like that, Olympics. And then, um, I started on your maps program with anabolic about four years ago, enjoyed that started running through pretty much most of your programs. Um, I just finished up a couple months ago, aesthetic, and I actually enjoyed that one so much that I redid. I'm starting, uh, actually I enjoyed phase one so much. I just, uh, I just did it again. I'm just wrapping up with that. I definitely noticed a good deal of muscle building. Um, I packed on quite a bit of weight for all my major lifts, you know, 10, 15 pounds for each of them over the I did it for six weeks, so I, you know, I was pretty, pretty excited for that. I like this uh, the commercial last... question. <laughs> What's that? Oh, this is a great commercial question. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, gotcha. Uh, so for the last six or seven months, I've really been focusing on, you know, trying to rebuild my metabolism because while I was doing that CrossFit, you know, I was working out two times a day. Again, not even tracking or probably not even close to what I was being need, uh, needed to be eating. So I've been getting up to about between 25 and 2,600 calories a day, uh, 185 protein, 114 fat, and 210 carbs. Um, I'm usually low on carbs, but that tend to get, um, it kind of affects me a little more. I feel a little, uh, I feel a little better with more fat in my diet compared to the uh, carbohydrates. Uh, in my off day, um, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu one to two times a week. Hey, hey. just a second, buddy. Uh, one to two times a week for about an hour. And then, uh, I got some like kettlebells and mace clubs in my garage. And I usually do. But, hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> uh, Aaron, I want to hear from you. Say hi real quick. Yeah. 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 Hey, let him ask his question. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of do that just a little bit, not too much, just enough to get a little bit of a sweat and a pump. Um, so my job, I'm a firefighter. Uh, we're, Busy some days, some days we're not, you know, I can be walking three, four miles a day or sometimes we're just, you know, sitting in our rooms all day or doing training, sitting in a class. So my big question is, um, I, I feel like I'm pretty good with getting my uh, calories up. I really haven't seen much weight gain, maybe fluctuating a pound or two since I've been eating, since I've been getting up to around 2,600 calories. And I really want to know, like the big question is, um, how much should I start to cut? Uh, to be effective, but without like absolutely destroying my metabolism back to where it is. We're just like, this is way too much. We can't handle this. You know, now you look at 500 calories, 700 calories. It's, that's my big question. I don't want to kind of backtrack to where I was and just, um, so I'm, uh, five, six, one eighty eight I have this as of this morning. So, okay. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. First off, uh, it's not, you don't have a broken metabolism. It doesn't need to be fixed. It's actually doing what it's supposed to, which is adapting. Okay, so yeah, broken metabolism would mean you dead. Like you're, you're, you're yeah, you can't thrive. But so you just want to get it uh, to be a, a bit faster. 
You know, it depends on what the person's total calories are. That'll help. That'll tell me how large of a cut I'm comfortable with. He's at 26. 26 yeah. Hours. I mean, I would say 500 is probably okay. Although I'd like to see you maybe move up a little higher Yeah. Uh, for your size. Okay. You Guy, know? your size and as active as you are, I'd like to see you in the you know 3,000 range before I were to cut you. Although you could. You know. Yeah. But 500 would okay. be the most. I, I wouldn't bring you below, lower than two to 2,100 calories for a cut. And you could try this. You could do a short cut. <clears throat> Like five week, okay. you know, five week cut at twenty one hundred calories, and then slowly back, reverse back, and try to get up to three thousand. If you, once you're at three thousand, I think it'll be a good place to start your cut because then you might end up somewhere around twenty three hundred uh, when you're okay. you know, start to get to the leanness that you're looking for. But a lot of it depends when I'm answering this uh, on the individual's total caloric intake, their size. I don't ever like to bring women below. And again, it depends, but I don't like to bring women below 1,500 calories. I don't like to bring guys below 1,800 calories usually. Um, unless gotcha. they're going on stage, then you know maybe you go a little more aggressive, but you have to have a good reverse diet afterwards. Oh, so. I don't even like to bring a guy lower than 2,000, especially his size. Yeah. I mean, the other question I would have too that I think matters in this answer is how do you feel? I mean, do you feel like you're satisfied? Do you feel like you're stuffing yourself to get to 2,600? Do you feel like you could eat more? Like, How do, how do you feel? I... Right? I feel stuffed. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I really, Good question. I, so for about two years, I did a lot of intermittent fasting prior to this. And I've been just kind of working on getting breakfast. You know, I'm so busy in the morning, you know, with work and stuff. I try not to eat, I eat something like a, usually like a can of salmon or something for breakfast just to get something in me. But you know, I'm with my macro with the, uh, the carbs I try to hit, it's a lot of fruit. And I, it's about like, a cup and a half of uncooked rice a day. And I'm just at the end of each meal, like lunch and dinner, I'm just, you know, I'm so full and bloated. So that's, what I'm trying to, Okay. Oh, I feel like maybe if I try to go into a little bit of cut, I might readjust my diet a little bit where I can start to eat a little bit more, but um, I don't know. I'm just like, at the end of the day, I'm just like, Ugh, I, I don't want to look at food sometimes. Yeah, great question, Adam, because uh, yeah, now, now it changes a little bit. Now I'm like, go for a cut. I think you're fine. If you feel stuffed. The other thing too is to try splitting up your meals. Uh, so instead of eating, you know, what you eat for lunch, maybe try cutting that up into, into two smaller meals. If, if it's convenient, if it works for you, I know you're a firefighter and I saw that you have a kid. Uh, so it might not be uh, feasible for you. Um, but that's another, that's another strategy. But if you feel full, 2,600 calories. Yeah. Go for, go for a cut. I'd go down to 21 or 2,100 calories, 2,000 calories and do that for a little while and then reverse back out. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. Hey, uh, you, you said you've gone through all of our programs. Do you have maps prime or prime pro? Cause I could see a lot of value in that for most people, but especially someone like yourself, yeah. you know? Yeah, I try. Um, I've got, I got those two as the bundle and I, I probably spend 10 to 15 minutes either before going to the gym or at the gym priming. Nice. Especially before like jujitsu and stuff, I Perfect. I try to get there about ten minutes early, and I try to I prime just about everything awesome. I can. Good man. All right, yeah. good stuff, man. And thanks for saving lives, huh? Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it. All Thank right. you. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Adam, because that made all the difference in the world. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the other factor, right? That uh, is important because I could sit here all day and say I would like you to be at 3,400 yeah, calories. He's force feeding himself. Yeah, but if you're already feeling stuffed, uh, I mean, that's like one of my favorite things to do. Like when I'm trying to bulk or build muscle or or speed my metabolism up, is I like to keep increasing calories and kind of pushing until I get to that point where I'm like, oh just so much. And then I just naturally come back where I just go, okay. Then it's easier. Yeah. And then I just go, I'm going to eat when I'm hungry. I'm going to make sure I hit my protein intake, see where my calories land for a while. It, it'll probably naturally put me in a cut, run that for a while. Eventually when you, when you consistently run a cut for long enough, you start to get hungry again. And then when you start to get that feeling again, where I'm like, Oh, I'm hungry. Oh my, oh, I'm thinking about food. I'm dreaming about food. It's like, okay, let's go back to a bulk. Let me increase my calories again, and you kind of naturally go that way. Yeah, it's good because you, you can't take out the person's uh, experience. So we could say a number is great all we want, but if if it results in them not feeling great, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because they're not going to be able to stick to it. So I, I'm so glad you asked that question. It completely changed what my advice would be. Yeah, I mean, if he because if he were to just ask me, I like I said, I would like you to be up in the three thousand calories, especially if he would say like, uh, you know, I could definitely eat more. Yeah, I'm exactly. Hungry, you know, okay, exactly. cool. Let's push it. Let's keep going. Let's keep going up. But if he's like, oh my god, I'm stuffed. It's so hard. Yeah. Okay, well then that's I'm not going to force him to continue to push that direction. Our next caller is Diego from Florida. Diego, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Why don't you say his last name, Doug? 
Duque. Duque. Yeah, Duque. <laughs> I thought, I thought uh, we we're getting pranked right now. <laughs> hey guys, Sal, Adam, Justin, Doug. How you doing, man? I'm really pumped. Really pumped to be invited on this. You know, pun intended. But anyway, I am a, a certified nutritional therapist, so. I got to say, I got to commend you for the for the great advice and, you know, all the stuff you give on nutrition as well. I really respect your knowledge. And oh, you know what? You. I've learned a lot from you guys, really. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So I've been listening to you guys for about a year now. And yep, you got me. I, I went ahead and purchased the Maps Anabolic. And, you know, as it was as a novel workout to what I've been doing. And now I have three three quick questions for you. First one, the background. I'm 58 years old and been bodybuilding for about since I was 17 years old, competed twice in my 20s. But since then, I've been on and off. But the past eight to 10 months, I've been really committed, guys. I've been I've been on it, working out hard, hardly missing a workout, put on some new muscle and got rid of my my pandemic, my pandemic belly. So um, <clears throat> what I was doing, I was doing a four day split, upper body one day, lower body the next day, repeat, you know, for, for the week. Been lifting heavy one day and really, really light the other day. So now that I decided to change things up with your maps on a ballot, even at my age, I decided to go with the advanced version. So I'm doing three days a week. So here's my first question. I started the program and you start the program with what? One to four reps. So I started very, very heavy. Uh, went my second fun fundamental exercise went very heavy again on the third foundational workout. I wasn't sure whether to keep heavy or to go light. So I decided to go light or did you guys have in mind to keep a steady weight and keep it the same throughout the program? So, you know, just, to, uh, I, I, I don't know if you want to go to the next question or let me, or let me answer that one first. first. Let's start with that one first, Diego. So two things. One, um, you've been working out for a, decades. Okay. So, uh, it's safe to say, you know, your body pretty damn well. Now we know how to program very well, but these programs are written for the general audience. And if, if anybody who follows any of our programs has that much experience and knows their body or is an expert or professional, it's always important to listen to your body and to individualize it. Because look, you know this probably better than most people. There's lots of individual variances. You know, MAPS Anabolic is a great layout, foundational layout. But if I train an individual, I'm going to change things yeah. based off how they feel um, and how they move. So if you get to that third workout and with your experience, you're like, you know what? I think I need to go lighter on this workout and just practice the technique. Then you're right. That's probably what you need to do. So it is laid out to stay consistent at a moderate to high intensity. However, again, with someone like you, if I'm, if you're telling me to train you, my question to you is going to be like, how do you feel? What do you think is going to be right for you? Well, and I'm going to trust what you say. The truth yeah. is the average person probably doesn't know how to even get to the level of intensity that you've learned to do over right. the decades. So when we write like three days like that heavy, cause you're probably scratching your head like, man, that's a, that's a lot of heavy lifting in a week. Well, uh, heavy to a person who's only been training, mm -hmm. you know, zero to two years of, of their life is is relatively low compared to someone like you who's been training for decades and really knows how to squeeze out that last bit of intensity. So you may be pushing yourselves on day or foundation day one, foundation day two yeah. so much that you roll into three and you're like, man, I'm pretty taxed mm -hmm. from one and two. And so if you were a client, yeah. So if you're a client of mine and we were actually training together, I'd be like, hey, let, let, we're going to take it back. You know, intensity wise, we're going to lighten the load up and just work on technique because we really got after it on foundation day one and foundation day two. So yep. like Sal said, you know, and that's something that we I think we we try and ex express on the show about our programs is that by no means do we think this is perfect for every single person and that you can never beat having an actual coach who's like with you or talking and you're you're your own coach. You've been doing this for so long that your gut probably told you like, okay, this is probably a little much for me. And so that's exactly what I would yeah. do is and, just scale back a little and bit. And remember, it's you're not going to fail. You're on these heavy sets. Remember mm -hmm. that. So if it's two reps or three reps, it's still 70, you know, 80% intensity. So it's not like what you're going, do you say, you're out. what do you say? For example, I'm bent. What do you say? It should be my reps in reserve. Uh, so I would do it more. Tank. Yeah, I would do it more like this. Like, let's say your max bench is 315. Like, you know, that that's the most you could do for one rep. And now let's say right. you want to do a MAPS anabolic workout where you do a bunch of sets of one rep. 
I would go 265, 275. <laughs> Uh, for one so, rep. For one yeah. rep, right? So so I'm going one to one, right? So 315 is your max for one. If I want to train for one, then I'd go 265, 275. If I was going to do like two or three, I'd go down to 235, 245, something like that, right? And it depends on the individual. So you want it to feel challenging, but you're not going to failure. If you treat the heavy workouts like you're maxing or close to maxing, you'll fry yourself for sure. Yeah, I probably did that my first couple workouts. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. so I'm going to, you know, ease off a little bit. Okay. So my, my next question is warm ups, uh, especially with the compound lifts. I'm used to warming up. I uh, have two, three warm ups of pretty li- re- relatively lighter weight, but I keep going up. And then I progress in weight. So, for example, on your on foundational workout one, you have six sets of benches. Say now we're talking about that. I progressively go up in weight and have a couple warm ups. Is that what you guys had in mind, or you guys uh, think that I should, you know, do you just have, hit a moderate amount of weight and just keep that weight? Do you have Maps Prime yet? I do not. This is my first one, so okay. So Doug's gonna, gonna Doug's going to send you Maps Prime, and you're going to understand why why Maps Anabolic is programmed the way it's programmed, and why we do Maps Prime. So Maps Prime is designed to prime your body before you get into your lifts. So that you can get right into it because this is common, right? So I, mm. uh, for many years, that's how I lifted, right? I get into bench and I, I would call, you know, my, my, uh, you know, warm up sets and then my working sets, right? right. So if I'm doing a, a five by five routine, I might actually end up doing seven sets of bench because the first two were my, you know, you know warm up or priming types That's where in maps prime. Maps Prime is designed to complement any of the programs that you're running, including if you weren't running a Maps Anabolic program. The idea is that you go through uh, our compass test, and it'll show you areas of your body, whether it has imbalances or if you've got kind of rounded forward shoulders. And and for since we're talking about bench, how you would prime your body to get ready to bench. Right, you'd want to set yourself up so you're in good position. You're able to light up and and produce as much force as possible with these types of mobility movements and isometric positions. Um, but in terms of like a, a warm up set, I mean, if you were to do that, which you know priming is going to be more beneficial, you know, you wouldn't really count that set within within the mix. Yeah, and and, and also the stronger you are the more likely you're going to have to ramp up even for your work sets. You know, like if somebody's got a, you know, a one, if they squat with 135, like, you know, they may do one warm up and then kind of get into it. When you're squatting 400 pounds or 300 pounds, like, you know, you got to feel it out because you can have, there's a big variance between when you can squat 400 and when you can only squat 350. People don't know this, but the stronger you get, the more off you could be if you feel off in terms of total weight. So don't worry about so much about like, it has to be the same weight each time. Listen to your body. Again, for someone like you who's been training as long as you have, don't ignore your the knowledge you've already built over decades of training yourself. So if it feels right to you to, to within those five sets, ramp up uh, within those five sets, then I'd say go for it. Right. Yeah, I just I just didn't want to go over on the volume because we don't want to do that either. So right. so that's what that's one of the big big things about the so you think that I should do this um, this prime session and then keep the weight pretty even? Yeah, I think I think what you'll find because uh, I would I would compare you more like most of us. We've all been lifting for a really long time, and when I prime really well, I typically and it, when I get into the big compounds, so bench, overhead press, squat, deadlift, I only need about one one light warm up set, and then I'm into it. Mm-hmm. So I prime really well. And then I get one light kind of warm up just to, and just and really what that warm up set is what is what Sal said because you, exa- all of us probably can squat deadlift pretty good weight mm-hmm. and you know I could have had bad sleep or just feel off and that really will affect ha- my heavy deadlifting day right. so and I'll know that the minute I I pull one thirty five even mm-hmm. if one thirty five feels kind of heavy for me i know okay this is not a 500 pound deadlift day yeah no matter real light like like 135 (laughs) right but but then sometimes i'll prime really well i'll hit that 135 and it comes up like butter it comes up like i'm just lifting the bar and i go oh yeah like today i'm getting after it right so to me my 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 priming is everything to get my body ready to go and i technically could get right into it but then i want one warm-up set just to kind of gauge, you know, where where am I going to be today? And then the next yeah, set, I'm if, getting into working sets. But if you feel like you still need to ramp up, I would I would listen. I would listen to your body. Because I've had those days, too, where I go, whoa, I feel strong. Mm-hmm. You know what? 
let me do another set, but this time with 315. And then I do that one. I go, okay, yeah, I'm definitely on. Or, you know what? I think I'm going to stay a little lower because I can feel my SI joint, you know? So, you know, don't forget, listen to your body while I do this. But, uh, you know, you said about the volume that you you, you got to be careful for the volume. I'm going to tell you this right now, just because of your experience and how long you've been bodybuilding, I'm going to make a guess that your issue will be the intensity, not the volume. If you overdo anything, it's going to be the intensity. I, I wouldn't worry yeah. about the volume <laughs> because yeah, yeah, because bodybuilding body, intense, bodybuilders yeah. tend to have a failure mentality. Go to the fatigue gets crazy, the yeah. pump is maxed out, so so that's going to be hard for you. So I wouldn't worry about seven sets of bench. Think more about like, am I overdoing the intensity? That's what's probably yeah, am, I leaving, so, am, am I leaving? Am so I leaving two? That's where that's what I need to monitor more than intensity because I can yes. I can go intense. I go I go pretty hard. That's what yeah. I figured. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I I tell you what, that, that's how I lifted for most of my career, and one of the biggest game changers was switching over to the two in the take mentality. And it's hard. It's hard when you have you've pushed for so I've heard long. You guys say that before, and yeah. I, and I, and I've always trained with a lot of intensity and a lot of mind 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 muscle connection. Um, but, uh, and I've heard you guys say this before, so yeah, I guess I just need to hear it, hear it's it very again. Different. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different. And it's hard. It's very hard for a guy that's been <laughs> lifting for a long time. And it, cause you're going to feel like, oh, I could have done so much yeah. more mm -hmm. but, or I didn't get the pump, but trust yeah. the process and actually follow the programming, but then follow it with that mindset of I'm going to leave two in the tank. And I promise you, once you've gone through a month or two of one of the programs, you'll see your strength gains. You'll definitely see it and it'll blow your mind because you'll felt like, man, I could have totally got after yeah. those workouts way more okay well i'm putting my trust in you guys like i said you guys give, give great advice and um you know i, I appreciate it and i'm going to take advantage of it and anyway my last question you know my original program was pretty basic it, uh but like i said intense i derived it from bill phillips you remember that guy bill I, phillips mm -hmm. absolutely yeah bill phillips was you know he's uh he's somebody i admire a lot because he took bodybuilding back in the day and made it very popular right so you know and just made it for all of life body of life like he called him he called his book but anyway um so given my age and and my experience what would be the progression uh after maps anabolics the nine weeks should i go back to what i did before or one of your other programs you're Perform gonna performance than aesthetic or symmetry Oh, yeah, or that. Yeah, I would say yeah. MAPS performance. I, I, I'm not too keen on the differences between the three. Okay, <clears throat> so so MAPS performance, mobility focus, much more functional. So you'll probably do movements and, and, and exercises. Which would be so good for a bodybuilder. Guy. Yes, or you, symmetry, or symmetry, because it's all unilateral training. It'll be a little more familiar, but it's pure. Right. Sim, it's pure. I mean, there's, there's long phases of unilateral training in there. That will benefit right, right. almost anybody, but uh, performance. I, I'll 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 lead because what Adam said, I'll, I think that edges it out because I'm pretty sure at least half the exercises in some of the phases you've probably never really trained. I mean, a guy with like you with your type of goals, your experience, I would, and if you were my client, I would run you on anabolic performance aesthetic, and then I would use symmetry to interrupt that cycle, and mm -hmm. I would like run you on that for. A, a That's while. indefinite. If you yeah, mean. and that would be with the goal in mind of building more hypertrophy. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yes. Yep. Hypertrophy, keeping your joints feeling great, staying mobile, being strong, multi-directional, being able yeah. to move laterally well. Looking good, that's the goal. And yeah. That yeah. literally, and, that, and that's what that's what I'm getting from talking to you. And we would literally run those three or four programs with symmetry, indefinitely. That's like a year's worth of training right there. That's the challenge, though. You know, it's the one that's going to be unfamiliar, and so the ego part of it's going to be challenging in terms of learning something yeah. new. But um, it, that's what that's where the benefit is, right? That's Everything right. you've found in your training, I'm sure, once you learn something new, it it opened unlocked a lot more. Uh, potential for yeah. you. Also, Diego, consider this. If you do performance, the hypertrophy gains are going to happen after performance. That's right. Okay? That's not saying that during performance, you're not going to see some differences, but because of the way okay. performance is going to balance you out and train your body, it's when you're done with performance and you go back to like, aesthetic. like a bodybuilder style workout, yes. like MAPS Aesthetic or MAPS Split, then you're going to be like, holy cow, my body is responding like crazy. So consider, so think, think of that yeah. because when you're going through performance, you may be like, oh, I'm not getting the pumps. I'm not building like I thought I would. Don't worry about it. After you're done with that three month program, that's when the yeah. stuff's going to be. After you're done, you have to buy more sleeveless shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm headed to the you gym as soon as I finish with you guys. <laughs> Good deal, man. Well, 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 Diego, we're sending you Maps Prime, and I'm going to send you perform. You, I'm going to send you performance you too because uh, because of your background, you gave us great compliments. So I feel really nice about myself. So I'm going to send you Maps <laughs> Performance as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, love you guys, man. Big hugs here from South Beach, Miami. Right on, brother. Thanks, brother. Right appreciate on, it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I think the big lesson here, uh, and again, it, we did not start out as fitness podcasters or influencers. We did. We were trainers for decades, so we will never say that an individualized program is not as good as a general one that we created. So if you have a lot of experience, yeah, uh, and, and even if you don't have a lot of experience, if your body's telling you something, listen to your body. It's more important you do that than you listen to us. Absolutely. So if I say do this, it's the best thing ever, and you do it, and it feels like you're going to hurt yourself or you don't feel good, no. ignore what I said. You just create a range. Yes. You know? and, and honestly, that's, that's the difficulty on our part is like, uh, do we give them a very specific amount of reps because people follow things to the T, and sometimes yeah. we're like, we got to give a little bit more yes. uh, of, of a range here. So if you aren't feeling like, if you're feeling like this is too taxing, you listen to that. Yeah. I also think he gave some pretty good nuggets, though, in there after talking for a while that, <laughs> I, I, and I know we said like, Hey, on that third day, probably scale back the intensity, you know, your body, but the coach in me too. And you, you hit it right on the head. Cause you know, like, cause he's got this <laughs> bodybuilder background that he probably chains to failure almost every oh, yeah. set. Mm -hmm. It's not the volume. Yeah, the exactly. If he, I actually think if foundational day one, foundational day two, he actually truly followed it to a T and actually left two in the tank and everything like that. He day three, he would feel okay. I do. That's what I think too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because he didn't and he overreached and he probably is pushing, oh, I think he's maxing out. Yeah. He's yeah. pushing it really hard. Then, okay, well now day three, the we got to adjust. A bit too much. Yeah. Now we got to adjust. Now we got to back off significantly and scale back on the intensity on day three uh, versus if you would have just scaled back on the intensity a little bit on day one, a little bit on day two, and then day three, you'd be okay. But since we right. went we full throttle that. on day one, full throttle day two, well, day three, now we got to really scale exactly. back. Our next caller is Audrey from Pennsylvania. Audrey, how can we help you? Hi, I'm so excited to get to talk to everyone. Um, my first question pertains to MAPS performance. So to start out, I'm a... Uh, lightweight rower on the U.S. national team, and due to some coaching complications recently, I haven't had any of my lifts programmed. So I had initially bought MAPS Performance to start in my off season, um, but I started about two weeks ago because of those complications. Um, and I just started with phase one. I was wondering if that was the right phase to start with, as I am about seven weeks out from World Champs and was wondering if maybe starting with something like phase three to work on power and acceleration would be a little bit better for where I am in my season. Oh, great we're question. Se we're yeah. seven weeks out. The program's 12, right, Justin? Mm -hmm. So I, I actually would try and we'd want her to end, like, right, as the yeah. season. Yeah, in terms of timing it out, like, I think your intuition is, is pretty, pretty on point. Um, yeah, cause the beginning we're trying to like create that base layer of strength and then move into more of the, um, uh, multi-planar type of strength. So phase three would be in timing wise in terms of having like, f you know, another four, another eight weeks there to, you know, work on your power and conditioning. If that's the goal for you at this point, you know, to kind of go into your competition, I mean, that makes the most sense yeah, to me. Yeah, you can shorten the phases too, go yeah. two, 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 so that it ends at the right time. But I have some more questions for you because, so I've trained some competitive rowers and um, you guys have probably some of the most intense practices and training that, I, that I've, I've seen with, with some of the athletes I've trained. Um, it's, you guys, they, they beat you guys up quite a bit. So I need to know what your training looks like now before I can recommend how you follow mass performance because- it may be too much in combination with your practices. So what, is, what do practices look like right Very now? Very good point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. So we do two to three practices a day. Um, we're on the water at least twice a day. Um, we'll do a, a combination of like steady state work and some faster, more intense um, pieces. We do have two lifting days programmed in um, already. So that's kind of what I was hoping to you know, fill the gap with. Holy shit. Okay. okay. So and you're going to replace whoa, those yeah. workouts. And this, is five days, <laughs> and this is five days a week? Yeah, but that means... Six, fuck, six fuck. days a week. <laughs> okay, so six days a week. So it's six days a week, which includes the two lifting days that they already typically will program. And so what you're trying to do is... Are we dropping those? Yes, and then we're, we're replacing them. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have to do that. Is that correct? We're replacing those? Yeah. Okay. Okay, here's my next question. How do you feel? And I don't mean like... Because I know you're tough... Cause like I said, I've trained uh, rowers and for some reason it's like, everything feels great. Even when you're, when you're not so great. So how do you feel? Do you feel stiff, sore? Do you feel like you need more sleep, more recovery? Mm -hmm. Do you feel joint pain? This is going to really determine the direction that I, I put you. Yeah. 
um, for the most part, I feel pretty good. I do have, you know, when I'm not on the wonder, I do have a big emphasis on recovery and I use like maps prime for mobility. Perfect. Um, so I think I do a pretty good job taking care of my body because like you said, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of wear and tear. Okay. So here's how I would do the two days. I would do one day recovery focused. So mobility, recovery, maybe some core work. And then the other day is where you do, you pick your mass performance workout and then you can pick uh, one of the three foundational from phase one. Yeah. One of the three foundational workouts from phase one. So instead of three, you're doing the two. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and you do like no, two No, he's weeks. doing one. He's he's doing one foundational, one, one mobility day. Yeah. that's because, I mean, So her two days of training would be, she would pick one of the foundational days, any yes. one she wants. And then her other training day would literally be a mobility day. Yeah. Mobility. Like, pull, because pull, I mean, pull, pull from one of the mobility two or three days <laughs> times a day of of rowing is a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and what you don't want to do is, so there's, there's a difference between, you know, doing as much training as you can tolerate and then doing the most amount of training that's going to give you the best results. Those mm -hmm. are two different things. Mm -hmm. So one is more than the other, but one gives you better results. So what we don't want to do, and here's a trouble that a lot of college athletes run into is they do the most they could tolerate. Mm -hmm. They just keep going until they, they hit the red line. But what, what's happened there is they've actually gone past the sweep spot of maximum results well also keep in mind when we wrote performance we wrote it with the intent of this being the off season yes, somebody's yeah. getting ready to go into the season and if you're already training at that high of volume already like i would never let you go through maps performance the way it's laid out it's just it's just too much it's yeah we wrote that without you practicing like in between so you know their points are valid i think um you know if you are to do those workouts i would definitely like keep the load down like keep the intensity a bit down just really like hone in on the skill and the um, the technique and, and really the um, the connectivity that you're going to get from that. So I think like that speed power, like you really want to keep the weight down and really get like that explosive uh, technique. Yeah. So so again, so just to just to lay it out, right? You, you got your practices. The first workout day where you're doing, you know, where you're lifting is mobility focused, recovery mobility focused. The second one, you pick a foundational workout from Maps Performance, and then as far as the phasing is concerned. If you have seven weeks, I would do each phase two weeks each, so that gives you six weeks, and then you have that week before you compete, which you would prob which I would probably have you take off or focus entirely on mobility, so you could peak for competition. Or Is she could reverse it out. Yeah. She could say you're trying to end the program at seven weeks, and so then back up seven weeks in the program right, and start right. there. But you want to have some time before your competition where you're where you're like you're allowing your body to totally yeah, rest. like a week or two before. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I also don't think I'll have access to a gym for the week of and maybe the week before. Oh, okay, so that's um, perfect. And then there's another part to your question. Yeah. I noticed here that you're, because you're a lightweight, you have to keep your body at a certain weight, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as a lightweight, I have to weigh in at 125.6 pounds um, two hours before racing. Um, and previously in doing this, I had focused on a one-to-one -one, um, ratio of protein in intake and body mass. Um, I think it worked pretty well to maintain my strength through the cut. I was wondering if, you know, maybe you had one or two other pieces of advice to focus on to help maintain the strength as I come down. What's your body weight right now? Um, I'm at about like 134. Okay. So you got to, you got to drop weight while going, as you're going into competition then. Yes. Okay. And you don't, you guys don't do the cuts like wrestlers do or whatever, right? I hope you don't do that because it's two hours before competition. <laughs> No, we do have some acute strategies that'll get me, you know, like four pounds within just a couple of days. So okay. that's something really reliable. Okay. Well, be careful because you, you, you're going to compete two hours after you weigh in and you don't want to hurt your performance just to try to, to make weight. Um, I like your one-to-one -one ratio. Um, I would go because it's such, uh, there's an anaerobic, anaerobic, um, you know, basically factors with the type of com competition that you're doing. I would go higher carb, lower fat. I wouldn't go low fat, uh, low carb, higher fat. You're, you're going to need the carbohydrates for the stamina and endurance. So one to one, mm -hmm. but make sure you don't keep the carbs too low. As long as the calories are low enough to get you down to that body weight, you're going to be totally fine. Okay. Yeah, she's not far from that weight, and she has plenty of time. I yeah, think totally. Be okay. Do you have so you already have mass performance? Do you have? I'd like to give you something to help you with recovery. Do I you would have like to see her with symmetry. 
Uh, I mean, that's something I would like every after athlete season, to have. After the season. After the season. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. To really okay. address yeah, any kind of underlying uh, issue. And, and, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things. Like, it's always surprising every time I have, like, somebody to go through that. Well, okay. So, with rowing, you could have dramatic imbalances. Right. Are, now, is I don't remember the names, but is this the one where you're – are you? Do you have You're two going on both oars? Sides, right? Do you have two oars, yeah. or are you only on one side? Like, okay. what's going on here? Yeah, so it's the lightweight quad. I have two oars. Okay, so she's balanced. Okay, but okay. still symmetry. I think that's a great. We'll send we'll send that over to you, Audrey. Do you have that's a wonderful. Do you have a clip or a video of you uh, rowing with your team? I do. Yeah. Could you share it with my team? Could you send that over in the email that you've been in contact with? I'd love to like share of that course. share that clip when we uh, post the, this video. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Very cool. Excellent. All right, thank you for calling in. Well, good luck to you. Thank you, bro. The the, the I've tra- I have you know most of my clients were. I have I don't people. think I've trained somebody at that level. I've trained some people that are rowers, but not at that level, bro. I, I trained yeah. I trained one three, rower on, three fucking times bro, a day. I, I'll never it's forget. <laughs> there's two there's two athletes I trained that I literally thought they were making it up. That the type of training it was, it was polo. Polo, yeah, polo, yeah, polo yeah, athletes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they live in the pool. Yeah, yeah. And then rowers. I couldn't believe the amount of volume no. of training that they did. Like, like she said, I'm two, glad three you times asked that because I just assumed that like she's still training and like you know leading into that. But all those practices on top of like training and working out, man, that's a lot of volume. Oh, it's insane. And so you add you know a full strength training. Oh, you we, you cannot. No you way. Can, you can't risk her being so sore that it starts to hinder her rowing practice. Yep. Yeah. So it's like it has to complement it, which is your advice of mobility first. So she help yep. her recover from all that training than just one day of strength training. And that's all you want to mess with, with someone like that much, that high of volume. Otherwise you start taking from her skill. People always, that's a thing that's too. It. And we always talk about this, that there's this idea. And because we know how much obviously building muscle and training weights yeah. can complement or make you a better athlete, but it can also hinder it if it starts to hinder your skills training mm-hmm. because nothing is going to make you better at your sport than getting really good at the skill yes. of your sport. Right. And so if you try to weight train so much to improve your sport that it starts to hinder your skills training, you'll actually go backwards as an athlete. 100%. That's it. Look, if you like Mind Pump, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. That's where we have free guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is out on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injuries.